Hi, I'm Adam Summer. You're listening to the Yershami Talk podcast with the support of the Yeshivat Debar Yushalayim in Harnof, Jerusalem. This is Demai Chapter 6, Halacha 4 in the Arch Scroll. This is 58A2. Halacha 3 was very, very short, and Halacha 3 and 4 are going to be put together to basically make an Arch Scroll daf, and that will do the daf yomi on that. The Mishnah in Halacha 4 is talking about tithes where the sharecropper has an agreement for harvesting olive trees, and then he's going to go process those olives into oil. And this is a very special one because the trees were there before. Normally, in a sharecropping agreement, you're going to be thinking about it in terms of grain. In a grain, you're getting a blank field. Somebody has to uh, plow it, they have to de-weed it, they have to water it, they have to sprinkle it with water to soften the oil to help the plowing get easier, they have to seed it, and then they have to tend it and then harvest it and bring it to the threshing floor and, and uh, thresh it. Over here, you're dealing with somebody who's hired as a sharecropper for olive trees, and those, those olives are already there. In fact, you don't need to plant the trees. And this is certainly past or law, so the trees are usable. And it's talking about a contract to make this into oil. So this is going to be a little bit different. And really, it's going to look like there's a contradiction between Halakha 3 and 4. There's not. And we're going to explain that. And really, we're talking about uh, really cases like more like profit sharing. Because over here, in a normal sharecropping uh, agreement, the sharecropper has to do all the work. Over here, most of the work's already done. He has to show up, he has to pick some olives, bring it to the press, press it, and they're going to split the oil. In the case of grain, there's far m more labor here. Now, one of the differences here is that the landowner can look at the harvest that's already there on the olives, and he can basically figure out more or less what the profit is going to be for himself and also for the sharecropper. He has an idea. He can look at this and he can see what it is. In the field of grain, you really have no idea what's going to be growing out of the earth. And that's going to be one of the differences. So there's some nuances here that we wouldn't know if uh, we didn't have this Mishnah. This Mishnah does move the conversation forward and give us new things that we wouldn't know ordinarily. Like where produce is already been growing and then it's really more like a profit sharing arrangement. Yes, it's a yes, it's a sharecropping arrangement, but it's really going to be more like profit sharing. Then the question is going to be what happens if there's a Cohen or Yisrael? How is that going to work? Now, the Mishnah says if one leases as a sharecropper olive trees for oil, this is the law. Now, there's a debate here about the olive trees and Really, the question is going to be that the olive trees, they already have these olives, and he just has to harvest the olives and process them into oil. And is it really like the olive trees is really going to be like land? And are you really treating these like land or not? So there are some opinions that when you're leasing this olive tree grove, that the olives and the olive tree is really like the land. There's another opinion that it's not. So the Gemara says if one leases as a sharecropper olive trees for oil, and again, there's less work to do here. It just has to pick them and bring them and squeeze them. This is a law. And it says just as the sharecropper and owner divide the hulin portion of the oil between them, so too they divide the truma portion of the oil between them. Even if the landowner is a cone, he cannot claim the truma for himself. So... The idea is that if the sharecropping agreement specifies an even division of the crop, then the ties are also going to be split evenly, and both the landowner and the sharecropper are each going to distribute half the ties. And if the landowner receives a third of the crop, then the sharecropper would do two-thirds, and the same percentages would be with the ties. So the, if you did two-thirds, one-third, then you know the guy who's doing one-third separates out a third of the ties, and the guy who's doing two-thirds separates out two-thirds of the ties. Now, the idea here is that, says the Pnei Moshe, that the Mishnah specifies no particular status for landowner and sharecropper. 
You notice that? It doesn't say this is a colon. It doesn't say this is a levy. It just says uh, in general. And that's, that's an interesting hiddish because uh, it would be, it's referring to a case where the, the, the sharecropper, and that's implying that the ruling holds true whether it's going to be a Kohn, a Levi, or a Yisrael. And so accordingly, if the share, if the landowner is a Kohn and the sharecropper is a Yisrael, and certainly if it's going to be the reverse, the ties are going to be divided between them. That's what this is trying to say. And this is also trying to say that it's not all transferred to the cone. Now, this is in contrast to what we just learned in the last Mishnah. Over there in chapter 6, Halakha 3, in that Mishnah, it's saying that if a Yisrael leases the field from a cone, all the ties go to the cone landowner. Now, what is going to be the difference? Well, over here, this is going to be something where the sharecropper has the information in front of him. He can go and he can look at this and say, oh, here's the trees, here's the olives, I basically know what it is, and same with the landowner. And so, in a way, it starts to shift into some other kind of business arrangement where a lot of that work is done, and it's going to be a little bit more like a partnership. So, the Gemara is going to, I'm sorry, is going to clear up what this contradiction is in uh, specificity. There's a dissenting view to this in the Mishnah. Rabbi Yudah says, where a Yisrael leases as a sharecropper olive trees for oil from a cone or a levy, or where he partners with a cone or the levy to sell the oil for half the profits. This, by the way, he's saying half, but it could be any profit split they are choosing. It could be two-thirds, one-third or 75%, 25%. But the, the idea is finished up in the mission and it says all the ties go to the landowner. That would be the co-owner of the levy. Now, according to Rabbi Yudah, it's assumed that they entered the sharecropping arrangement with the understanding that the Israel sharecropper is going to relinquish his portion of the ties to the cone landowner. And this is uh, in consonance with the ruling of the last mission. And the Gemara is going to explain Rabbi Yudah's reason as well as that of the Tanakama. Now, I want to point out that the Tanakama disputes Rabbi Yudah in the case of a Yisrael who's going to partner with a cone to sell his olive oil. And according to the Tanakama, the ties are still going to be divided equally as any two partners. So according to Rabbi Yudah, they're all going to be the property of the cone, but according to the Tanakama, it's going to be split evenly. So if you have a partnership for selling olive oil and one is a cone and one is Yisrael, the Tanakama is going to say that very nice, but he has 50%, let's say it's 50-50, he has 50%, he has 50%, both of them separate out the tithes, and the Yisrael doesn't need to transfer that, and it's not assumed that it's transferred over to the cone. Again, this is talking about implied. Okay, if you have a contract in there where it spe specifically says, as part of this transaction, I get the, the truma meiser, well, that's part of the condition, and that's going to be part of the sale, and that's okay. But we're talking about here something that is not written down, and it's an implication. And the question is, with this implication of doing this transaction, is it implied that he gets the rights to this property, that he doesn't make this extra conditional term that it's already implied that he has it. And the Tanakhama say no. Without that extra uh, contractual thing in there, you don't have that right. And if it were 50-50, you would basically uh, split up the ties like between a Yisrael and a Yisrael. And basically, he, separate, he gets half the crop, you get half the crop, and then he takes half his ties from his half, and you take your half, and that's that. You don't get access to his ties. So again, this is all talking about implied. The Gemara is going to talk about this disagreement between the Tanakama and Rabbi Yudah's disagreement as to whether all the ties of the olive trees go to the Kohen landowner, or whether the sharecropper and the landowner are going to divide the tithes. And the Gemara is going to go through the reasoning under each dispute. But again, Tanakama says you just split it and you, you know, the cone doesn't get to keep your tithes.
Gemara says that Rabbi Yudah treats the leasing of the olive trees like leasing land. And basically, just as a Yisrael relinquishes the ties when he leases land from a cone, so too he relinquishes the ties when he leases olive trees from a cone. Now, why is he saying this is like land? What, what's going on here? Well, the idea here is that you're talking about already laden olive trees, and that crop has already grown, it's ripened, and that happened before it came into the hands of the sharecropper. Sharecropper didn't have to do any of that work. And all it requires is some harvesting, and you take it over to process it into oil, and everybody knows exactly up front what the profit's going to be, and he doesn't need to give it any other thought. And he's going to be open to other means of realizing financial potential, and therefore he's going to be unlikely to relinquish that profit. And the idea is that you know what might be gained from this privilege of choosing tithes is going to be where he's not going to cede the privilege to that landowner. Why? Because, first of all, olive oil is going to be very valuable. It's going to be a very valuable resource. And he's going to be less, like, less likely, the sharecropper is less likely to relinquish his tithing privilege in the case of these olive trees because it's valuable. And with this kind of crop, he's going to want to have this value and then give it to whichever cone he wants. Why? Because he wants that increased value of the benefit of gratitude. So the Rambam also, by the way, is going to hold that explanation. Basically, Rabbi Yudah's ruling applies only where one leases olive trees and where the crop is very valuable. But Rabbi Yudah is not going to hold that where he's leasing other sorts of fruit trees. And that's why the Mishnah is specifying olives and olive trees because of the increased value of this. Now, the Rosh and the Rosh are going to have a little bit different uh, takes on this. And he's going to be saying that he's going to be he's going to be um, presuming that he's not going to see this privilege to the landowner. And the sages are going to be saying that the ties are divided between them. And this reasoning is not only in the case of olive trees, but any sort of tree, uh, fruit tree, least from a cone for sharecropping. Now, why would it be any fruit tree? Again, the work is already done. Somebody already plowed it. Somebody already planted it. Somebody already tended to it. You know, we looked in Masechet Shvius, and we see there's a lot of work that goes into maintaining an orchard when you look in chapter one in Shvius. You have to fumigate the trees. You have to take care of it if there's moldy parts or rotting parts. There's a lot of work that has to be done with the roots to protect it. And so somebody else already did all that. This is going to be a different kind of case where it's more like a partnership. Now, let's look at the Tanakama position. The Tanakama is saying that they do not treat leasing the olive trees like leasing land. And so they're going to be saying that although a Yisrael who leases land from a Kohen does relinquish the tithes, one who leases olive trees does not. And so over here, the, the previous Halakha, Halakha 3, was stating that if you had a Yisrael uh, sharecropper and he's the, in the field of the Kohen of the Levi, all the tithes go to the landowner. Now, Rabbi Yudah's ruling in the Mishnah is that all ties of the olive tree are going to go to the cone landowner. That's going to follow that earlier ruling in Halakha 3. But in Rabbi Yudah's view, an olive tree is treated no differently than a grain field. And in both cases, since the landowner is eligible for ties and the sharecropper is not, it is assumed that the sharecropper sees his portion of the ties to the landowner. Now, the sages in this Mishnah are ruling that the ties of the olive tree are divided between the Israel sharecropper and the cone landowner. And basically, this ruling looks like a contradiction with this earlier Mishnah in Halakha 3. And over there in Halakha 3, it's saying that it's going to allocate all the ties of the cone's field to the landowner. Now, the Gemara is going to be trying to explain that the sages are drawing a distinction between one who's leasing land for plowing and one who leases trees that are already there with fruit where someone else already did the work. 
And in the first case, the sharecropper's attention is focused on the success of the future crop. And that yield is unknown. You don't know what's going to come out. But over here, the you're just going to look at it. You're going to see that, oh, I can see how much value is in here. And in the first case where you're doing, you know, you're hoping for the best and you're going to go do all the work, there's not a lot of monetary value to the benefit of gratitude that the, the, um, the Israel has, okay, because you don't know how big the crop is going to be. And it might end up being insignificant. And so basically over there, he's willing to relinquish this privilege to the landowner. But over here, the Kohn and the Israel, when they make the contract, they can look at it. And this has a high value to this. And they can look at it and they can say, oh, I know how much uh, oil and how much tithing is going to come out from this. And over here, it's not going to be assumed that he's going to waive this right to the Kohn. He's going to want to keep this valuable right. Yes, he can't eat it but he can give it to somebody for the benefit of gratitude. And that benefit of gratitude has more value. And so that's why the sages are going to be treating the case of the olive tree a little bit different. The Gemara is going to elaborate on Rabbi Yudah's viewpoint. And it's going to say that Rabbi Yudah equates leasing trees with leasing land, following is clear. And if Rabbi Yudah holds like Rabbi Eliezer that we saw in the, in the, to my uh, chapter 6 halacha 1, then in the case of our Mishnah 2, he's surely going to apply Rabbi Lazar's ruling. Rabbi Lazar's ruling over there was going to be that it's implied that the Kohen gets to keep it. It's going to get to keep the ties. Now the Gemara continues, says, Rabbi Lazar stated regarding a Kohen or a Levi who leases a Yisrael's field that the ties all belong to the Kohen or the Levi, for it was on condition that they came to lease the field. Again, over there in chapter 6, Halacha 1, and even Rabbi Eliezer agrees with it, that is going to be an implied contract. But if they wrote down that the ties belong to the Israel, then everybody agrees the ties belong to the Israel. We're talking about an unstated part of the contract. So over here, the Gemara says, here too, when... The Kohen of the Levi leases the olive trees for oil from the Israel. The ties belong to the Kohen of the Levi, and that's on condition that they came to lease the trees. So although Rabbi Yudah's case is where a Yisrael leases the trees from a Kohen or Levi, the same is true um, with Rabbi Lazar's point, where the Kohen of the Levi was not the landowner but the sharecropper. And basically what this is saying is they're saying that, look, as an implied part of the contract, the Kohn wouldn't come and do this work unless he got to keep the tithes. And so too, even in the other case where it's the Kohn landowner and he's leasing it to the Israel, they're all saying, look, it's implied that I'm leasing it to the Israel because it's assumed I'm going to keep the oil. I'm going to keep the extra uh, tithes. And basically he's saying that um, you know, he's drawing a, uh, he's drawing a, uh, a comparison. Rabbi Yudah is drawing a parallel between leasing the land and leasing the trees. And he's basically doing it with Rabbi Eliezer's ruling. And accordingly, where Kohn leases the olive trees from the Israel, basically all the ties, according to Rabbi Yudah and Rabbi Eliezer, with this implied part of a contract, again, not written out as a contractual term, but as an implication, is that the cone is going to get all of the ties, and part of doing the business with this guy is that he's ceding the ties over to the cone. That's not the view of the Tanakama. The Mishnah taught another dispute between the sages and Rabbi Yudah between the division of ties between a cone and a Yisrael who are partners in business venture. And again, these olive trees start to look more like partnership in a business venture than a regular sharecropping agreement. And that's kind of what this halacha is about. We're talking about something where the sharecropper doesn't need to do the work. He just needs to pick some olives. And so you might come along and say, well, wait a second. This olive tree is might be a little bit different case than a regular sharecropping agreement because the landowner doesn't need to do the work. The landowner just needs to pick some olives. And in any case, if you were doing, you know, from start to finish with a grain field, 
he'd be picking over there, and over here he's picking. But look at all the extra work he's not doing. And so somebody might come along and think that, you know, perhaps you're entitled to all of these ties, or perhaps you're not. And the Mishnah, you know, is teaching this, that this is really going to be more like a business adventure in this kind of case, where, and it's going to be really an identical dispute with respect to other gifts of the Kohenim. So the Gemara is saying that if a Kohen's cow was placed in a partnership with a Yisrael herdsman, the Gemara says, and the cow then gave birth to a Bechor, the Bechor belongs to the Kohen. So again, this is the firstborn from the animal. The Gemara says these are the words of Rabbi Yudah. But the sages say the Bechor uh, belongs only to the two of them and it is the exclusive property of neither. So, very interesting. According to the sages, the owner and the herdsmen divide the Bechor between them. The Kohn's half is his to keep. The Israel gives the half of the Bechor to whichever Kohn he chooses. And this dispute really is paralleling the one cited in this Mishnah regarding a Kohn and Israel who are actually going to be partnering to harvest the cone's olive trees or even to sell a cone's olive oil. And in that case too, the partners are going to be sharing equally in the profit and the risk. So the Gemara is going to continue. Rabbi Yuda argues in this case that, and he says back to the sages, do you not admit to me in the case of the ties of a cone's field that was leased to Yisrael sharecropper that the ties belong entirely to the cone? And here too, the Bechor should also entirely belong to the Kohen. So in this earlier Mishnah, in Halakha 3, in chapter 6, Halakha 3, that when a Kohen leases his field for sharecropping to Israel, all ties belong to the Kohen. Why? Because the landowner, we're presuming that, you know, with the landowner, we're presuming that he did a deal with the Israel with the understanding from the beginning that he has to relinquish the ties back to the Cohen landowner. And otherwise, he wouldn't have necessarily done this deal with this uh, with this uh, tenant, with this sharecropper. So this is indicating that in an agreement between parties, one where you have a Cohen and the other where you have the Israel, that might create uh, gifts for the Kohenim, it's presumed that the entire gift gets relinquished to the Cohen. And in this Brisa case, too, the presumption should be that the Yisrael should relinquish his share of the Bechor to the Kohen owner. But that's not what the Tanakhama says. The Tanakhama is going to defend their position in this Gemara, and they're going to say to Rabbi Yudah, the Kohen receives all ties because the field itself belongs to the Kohen. And it stands to reason that he reserves the ties of his own field for himself. In other words, in the case of the ties that we see with a sharecropper having partial ownership only of the crop, but not the slightest ownership of the field itself. And so Rabbi Kenievsky is pointing out about this, that once the crop has been harvested and divided, the field returns back to the owner. And should the field decrease in value during the term of the sharecropping agreement, that loss is entirely the owner's. Why could that be? Well, perhaps uh, the, the uh, sharecropper... Um, you know, under-fertilized it. And perhaps uh, the nutrition that came out of the ground was more uh, because it was not fertilized enough. And so now the field that you have for future seasons is worth a little bit less. In other words, the field is owned by the Cohen in that case, and he has all the risk. And because the field is solely the property of the Cohen, the logic dictates that he's going to reserve all the ties for himself. Again, this is going to be in a grain field. But over here, we're talking about something a little bit different, where you're talking about the olives, where somebody else did all the work. He just shows up, picks some olives, and they split, split it. So over here in the grain field, where the sharecropper has to start from scratch and do all the work, it could be assumed that the Israel sharecropper understands this is an unspoken condition of the agreement, and he's prepared to relinquish the portion of the ties to the cone. Why? Because the, the landowner has a lot of risk here. You know, maybe the sharecropper will damage the field. Maybe he'll do the 
irrigation channels wrong. Maybe he won't irrigate the land right. So there's a lot that could go wrong. And uh, also, you know, sometimes things rain too much and, and, you know, you can have topsoil get eroded away, things like that. And that does affect uh, future seasons. So it's assumed that you're doing business and that you're going to take the ties because it's your land. And over here, it's understood that the Israel is going to seed this. Because again, this is also really not that much value. You don't know what's going to be growing. Over here, in the case of the olive trees, though, somebody else did the work. And this, this crop is going to be a very valuable crop. So it's going to be assumed that the Israel is going to want to keep this and go and um, you know, give it to whoever he wants. Now, the sages defend their position, and they said that, said back to Rabbi Yudah, the cone receives all the tithes because the field itself belongs to the cone. And the Gemara says the cow, however, belongs to the two of them. In other words, both the cone and the Israel both bear financial risk involved in raising it. In other words, over here, the cone has all of the land. But over here, the both of them share the risk on this. They both, both have risk. And so that's, that's going to be the difference between it. The sages are going to say that, in this case, the cow too, if it had belonged entirely to the cone, uh, he would have accepted all of the financial risk, and the Bechor would indeed belong exclusively to the cone, just as in the case of the ties with the field. But the fact that the cow, the cow is not the exclusive property of the cone basically means that just like they both have to share the risk for raising it and taking care of it, the Bechor is also going to be a product of that. It's going to be divided between them. And so basically, says Rabbi Kanievsky about this, that the sages are saying that where the contract assigns none of the risk to the herdsmen, then it's going to be where Rabbi Yudah's ruling is correct. But since the herdsman bears no risk, he is not regarded as a part owner of the cow, but merely as one who is getting a wage for his service. In other words, uh, his portion is going to be the cow's offspring. And since then the cone is the sole owner, he does get the bechor for himself. But over here, where we're talking about the two of them having risk, then it's going to get split. And over here with the olives, that, you know, why are you saying that there's risk with the olives? Well, the sages are saying back that since the Israel shares equally in the risk of having to harvest and produce all of this oil, uh, he's partially owner of the oil. And so it's not presumed that he relinquishes his, his share of the tithes. And they're going to disagree also that the law of the olive tree is going to be like law of the land. And according to Rabbi Yudah, they're going to say that olive trees are like land. And therefore, it's going to be ruling that where the cone and the Israel form, it's going to be in halaha, it's called an iska, which is a, a joint a partnership. And, you know, that's going to be one where somebody provides capital and the other person provides labor. And basically then with this ISCA, uh, they're going to say that, you know, they're forming this partnership to market the cones olive oil and they're going to divide the ties just in the case of the Israel who works the field of the cone sharecropper. But the ties are saying, the, the sages are saying that the olive trees are not like land. And basically, it's not going to be like an isca like that. And although the sharecropper and the landowner are going to divide the ties of the field, the partners uh, of the oil venture do not. And so it's basically saying that the mission is disputing the oil venture, and that's going to be on two disputes. One is going to be on uh, comparing leasing and a partnership, and the other is going to be on the viability of comparing land and olive trees. So there's two parts to what the rabbi, what Rabbi Yuda and the sages are disputing. And uh, basically you can look at it like this. You can say that one is going to be comparing leasing and a partnership. And so when you're doing a deal with this kind of already uh, existing olive tree farm with uh, harvest and you can see all the olives that are there and you can calculate how much value is there, it's not the same as coming to a blank field where you have to do all the work and you don't know what's going to come out. So that's going to be one difference. It's going to be more like uh, a partnership than like a lease. 
And in the case of just a grain field, that would be really more like a lease, not a partnership. And over here, we're also talking about, you know, is a grove of olive trees really going to be like uh, comparing land? Is it like just leasing land? The Tanakhama say no. So the sages are differentiating between the agreement of the cow, where the risk and the adventure gets shared by both partners. And in the case of leasing a field, where all of the risk in the land is really just going to be on one partner. So the sages are going to say like this in a brisa, where one appraises an item in advance of a joint business venture, the risk is assumed by both partners. But where one merely leases an item from another, like a sharecropper, the risk is assumed entirely by the lessor. In other words, that the yeah, you know, over here, the, the person who's leasing the land is going to provide labor. And for that sweat equity, they're going to get a share in the profits. And the, the leases of this type are generally entered into without a prior appraisal to determine the value. And without this kind of previous appraisal, it's assuming that the tenant accepts none of the risk associated with the venture. And any losses are assumed by the owner himself. But in the case of the olive tree, the olive tree, you know, you can come and you can appraise the value in advance. And you can basically share that risk. And that's going to be the difference. So having talked about this Barisa with this dispute between Rabbi Yud and the sages, they're, they're now going to move on to a related Barisa. And then we're just going to finish it up. This is the last part. Gemara says, regarding a Kohen who gave money to Israel, with which to buy produce on his behalf. And the Israel will then sell it for half the profits. This is the law. It says, if the Kohen investor said to the Israel merchant that uh, that which the produce increases or decreases in value is uh, partly mine and the ties are to be yours, it is permitted. So, um, so what, what this is, is this is saying that it's absolutely permitted to pay the managing partner with ties and those ties are going to be the Cohen's own property, and they're his to dispose of as he, as he chooses. And if he chooses to pay the managing partner with the ties, there's nothing amiss. That's going to be the insight by the Mara Fulda. And over here, with regards to this, this arrangement is like an ISCA partnership, where one partner is an investor who's putting up capital or merchandise, and the other is just going to manage the investment. He's going to put up expertise and labor, but no capital. And in this case, the investor is the cone, and the managing partner is the Israel. Now, by rabbinic enactment for iskas, unless otherwise specified, it's going to be like this. Both the investor and the manager are going to share equally in both profit and risk. So if the investment increases in value, each receives half the share of the profit, and if the value decreases, each shoulders half the loss. And since the manager is responsible to return half the capital intact, whether or not the venture uh, is successful, the sum is essentially loaned to him, which means that the profit he receives when the venture succeeds can't be viewed as a wage paid to him by the investor, but is rather his own property from the start, and it's earned as profit on the money he borrowed. And this gives another difficulty because if the manager's profits are the fruit of capital rightfully his own, uh, then they're not a wage for his services in managing the investment. And then he's technically receiving no payment for his managing services. And this is going to be an Aribis problem because if a service is rendered by a borrower to a lender free of charge, this constitutes forbidden Aribis. And the problem can be rectified only by paying the manager, the manager, the managing partner, a separate fee for his services. And that's the deep point here. In other words, that if you have a service rendered by a borrower to a lender free of charge, and the person put up the put up the uh, you know put up the money, and basically that money is like equity. It's ribus. And Ribas is very serious. You know, there's a when you look at the resurrection of the dead and the bones from uh, Ezekiel, there was only one person who was not resurrected. Who was that? 
That was a person who charged ribas. And Ezekiel said over there, it says uh, in one of the Midrashim, it says, who is this person who was not resurrected? And they said back to him, oh, that's the person who lent on ribas. So very serious. Ribas is very serious. And so if you don't do this right, you might have a ribas problem. So the Gemara is going to present the opposite case. And it's going to say, however, regarding a Yisrael who gave money to a cone with which to buy produce on his behalf, and the cone will then sell it for half the profits, this is the law. It says, if the Yisrael investor said to the cone merchant, that which the produce increases or decreases is uh, partly mine and partly yours, and the ties are yours, uh, if the Yisrael gave the cone his separate wage for managing the venture, it's permitted. But if not, it's prohibited. Why? Again, we have that ribbis problem. So in other words, it's like the Yisrael is giving working capital to be in this venture to the Yisrael. And basically the managing partner has to get a, a, a fee, a payment to do the work because otherwise it's like you borrowed the money w with interest and it's prohibited. And in this case, it's identical to the last one, except the investor is the Israel, the managing partner is the cone, and the Israel is informing the cone that he's going to transfer his share of the ties to the cone. And this is the intended part for the cone's wage for managing the investment. In other words, what the Israel is trying to do, he's trying to say, look, you, you know, I'm putting up the money, you're going to be managing partner, and look, you're going to get back the ties. The ties are going to be yours. Well, wait a second, though. That, <laughs> that's really a problem because basically you're using this tithing in this business venture to pay the cone. And you're using it to get the services uh, to be the managing partner. And, you know, over here, the purpose of this wage to the managing partner is to remove the ribis problem. And uh, over here... It, it's going to be like you're using a tithe. The tithe anyway is given to the Kohenim. And the, the tithe is, is the right of the Kohenim. So you can't use something that's the right of the Kohenim to, to pay him on the venture. And really what it, what it is is that you're giving this tithe in a, in, you know, in a way where it's like it's not representative of an independent payment for services that he's doing. And yes, okay, there's a, there's a transfer of the ties, but it looks like the cone services are being done free of charge, and it's going to violate this prohibition of ribis. And this is going to be the problem. So the Gemara is going to continue. It's going to finish up. And it's going to say that, you know, basically the previous... In the previous brisa, it's prohibiting a certain uh, business venture between a Kohen and Yisrael because it's going to look like ribis, and it's also going to be a problem with uh, desecration of tithes. And over here, the Gemara is going to say that if a Yisrael was selling 60 lugan of olives in their Tevil state, and the Kohen says to him, uh, give them to me, and I will give you uh, give you in exchange 60 rectified, in other words, it's been tied, lugging of olives, it's permitted. Why is that going to be? Well, you're trading one pat, uh, one part of the olives where the ties have not yet, been, not yet been separated, and it's, you know, you're not allowed to sell Tevil produce, and it looks like this person is ignoring the rule. And this exchange does not violate the uh, prohibition of uh, ribis, nor does it violate the problem of a cone who assists on a threshing floor, um, because in this case, the cone who requires the olives but does not have them on hand is going to offer to exchange 60 lugan of tithe olives for the Israel 60 lugan of tevel olives. And this represents a significant profit for the Israel who would otherwise have to distribute a large portion of the olives as tithes, and and uh, although the cone does not pay later, the Israel is receiving more value than he gives, and that exchange uh, does not value does not violate uh, 
the prohibition of ribis, which is going to be prohibited interest payments for two reasons. One is the Israel does not state explicitly that he's allowing the Kohen extra time to repay. And also the Kohen simply asks for the olives and says that he will repay without specifying any particular time frame. And while this is true that the exchange profits the Israel, the Kohen doesn't lose anything by it because he has part of it anyway. And, you know, he has full use of the entire 60 lug and he receives. And since even the ties uh, he separates are not distributed to others but belong to him, he may, he may use it. And since that exchange doesn't cost him anything, it's not going to be a ribus problem because he's not paying interest. So that kind of exchange is going to be allowed and the exchange does not appear to violate the prohibition against a cone on the threshing floor, which forbids a cone to desecrate the holies by paying for tithes. And one might imagine that since the 60 tithe login are worth more to the Israel than the 60 untied login gave the Israel, the exchange appears to be a purchase of the truma that's inside of it. And the Bryce is informing us that it's actually not a purchase. And the cone, from the cone's perspective, he's returning precisely what he receives. Why? Because part of the ties are in there, and he owns part of the ties. Now, the Gemara finishes up, and it says, and, uh, but if the cone says to him, I will give you in exchange 60 lugan of oil in their tevel state, and you will divide their ties, uh, you and I will divide the ties, it's prohibited. So in this case, both the olives are given, and uh, the, those uh, received are untied. And the Kohen stipulating that the tithes of the 60 lugan, which he's repaying with the oil, still belong to the Kohen. And in turn, half of the tithes that the Israel does, he has to give it to this Kohen. And basically, the Kohen and Israel gain uh, half the tithes uh, that's going to be returned from the Israel. And the Gemara is going to say what the problem is. So the Gemara is going to, is going to um, show a contradiction. The Gemara says, when he gives the Israel all the tithes, the Bryce has said it is permitted in the first clause, and when he gives only half the tithes, it's prohibited. And doesn't isn't this a contradiction? So the Gemara is going to resolve it. Rabbi Yossi says, here in the second clause, the Bryce's case is where the Israel explicitly extends the time for him to repay, and therefore the exchange is prohibited. And in the Bryce's first case, the Israel did not explicitly extend a repayment time, and therefore it's going to be uh, permitted. Now, the Gemara is going to differentiate what's the difference between this and that, and then we're done. It says, and indeed, they taught this explanation in, the, in this price. It says, if the Israel extends the time for him to repay, it is prohibited because of ribis and because of the disgrace of the holies. So, again, it's really that Rabbi Yossi is explaining that in the Bryce's second case, the Israel stated explicitly that he's allowing a delay in repayment. And this, combined with the Kohn's transfer of half the ties to the Israel, creates the appearance of a ribus violation. And it could be assumed that uh, the transfer of ties is intended as, as a repayment. And this extending of the, of the payment time is going to be a problem. And also, uh, it looks like you're exchanging ties for an extension of a loan. And that, by the way, becomes a problem with desecration of the holies because... It looks like he's using um, the ties for a commercial transaction. And for both of these reasons, the trade described is prohibited. But in the first case, the Israel did not state that he's allowing a delay in repayment. And therefore, neither reason applies over there, and that's why it's permitted. But over here, with regards to, to the olive trees, um, there's a lot going on here. And basically, it's going to be a lot more like a partnership than a regular sharecropping agreement. And over here, because it's more like a partnership, and both of them are sharing the risk, that is why the Tanakama are saying that they're going to split the they're going to split the crop according to the arrangement, and they're going to both separate out the ties. And the cone does not have the access to the Israel's ties because of that. Have a great day.